Okay. <clears throat> so, so far we have discussed problem analysis and domain analysis, uh, which are key processes of synthesis-based architecture design. But uh, uh, there's also another process, alternate space analysis, which is uh, both in synthesis-based design, but also in mature engineering, as we said. So it, it is all based on a problem-solving approach. This was the problem-solving model that we had, which we said it's uh, all the mature engineering disciplines are based on this. And there's one uh, process uh, called alternative space analysis, where you try to identify the alternatives and evaluate these with respect to some criteria, quality criteria, and select the most feasible alternative. So alternative management is an explicit problem solving concern. So if you do problem solving, if you, what you first do is state the problem, look for the solution domain, and then you list a set of alternatives, try to find the most feasible alternative. With respect to what? To, to some quality concerns. That's the fourth <coughs> process in the synth-based uh, software architecture design. Uh, we will basically focus on, on technical problem analysis and solution domain analysis in the project. So you don't, you don't need to do the, 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 the fourth process due to time limitations. What's the process here? So uh, there are actually two steps. Define alternatives for each concept and describe the constraints among these alternatives. If you look at the current architecture design approaches, uh, usually there is no explicit process for this. There are some implicit uh, reasoning where they state the author state that you have to identify the alternatives, look at the alternatives, but there is no specific process for that. Now, if we take this alternative space analysis, we can actually see alternatives at two levels. The first one is the within the domain model. So it's a domain-driven approach, but already in domain domain analysis, we can see that there are several alternatives. Like we have seen it also in the transaction system uh, case. We have seen that there are several scheduling al algorithms, alternative sch several recovery management uh, uh, protocols, transaction measures, etc. So the idea is the, the, the concern in the alternative space analysis, what are these alternatives? Second, how to, to model uh, how to select these alternatives? Which one should we select? Which one should be included in our system? That's the first uh, source of, the, of alternatives. The second source of alternatives, which I will explain separately, occurs when you map to design. So, I, so far, actually, we have looked at domain. We have derived the conceptual architecture, the domain architecture. And we, have to, we will map that to the software architecture, typically in our case a module view, as I will explain later on. When we do that, we will have also multiple alternative ways. So that is how many alternative designs are possible if you map to a module view. How to select these again based on quality criteria. Let's first look at the, the first within the domain model. This is the example, the scheduler. It's the knowledge source we could find based on that. Actually, we defined the, uh, the sub-architecture, the architecture of scheduling, scheduler. And in these knowledge sources, we can identify several alternative schedulers, those and so on. Aggressive two-phase locking is just one alternative scheduling mechanism. 
conservative two-phase locking, strict two-phase locking, timestamp ordering, serialization graph testing, optimistic control. So they are all alternative scheduling protocols. So alternatives from the domain. Already the domain provides you alternatives. When designing the architecture, we have to somehow know these alternatives. So if we define a, a feature model of the scheduler, could be like this. Every scheduler has a scheme, a strategy and performance failure detector. The scheme can be based on two-phase locking, timestamp ordering, optimistic serial. Strategy can be aggressive or conservative. Aggressive means if there is some violation, it immediately uh, aborts the transaction. Conservative, it delays the incoming messages. Oh. Performance failure detection, you can, can have deadlock detection, if in the blocking, restart, cyclic restart, etc. So if we take this all, it, we have about 32 alternatives. These are alternative features, right? We can take one, so two-phase logging, aggressive, focusing on deadlock detection. The same for recovery manager. We can define a feature diagram. The mandatory features of recovery manager are log manager, failure at home, synchronized, restarting, checkpointing. Again, there are alternative features, sub features of these mandatory features. So it appears that there are 118 alternatives defined in the domain, which means you can have. Uh, a specific implementation of these. You can select one of these 180 and define. Alternatives example. This is a different uh, formulation. Two-phase locking. You select one of these, one of these, one of these. The same for the recovery manager. In the transaction manager, they, they work together, of course. Scheduling and recovery manager. So the total alternatives there are then, it's like the combination, right? 32 times 118. Huge. So what should we do in alternative design space analysis? We actually look at the alternatives of these concepts. We look at scheduling, transaction management, policy management, data management, and check what the alternatives are. Here we had 118, here about 32. We look at them. So that's alternative space analysis. But not all the, uh, it appears that like we have also in future diagrams, not all the combinations are possible. You cannot just select an arbitrary scheduler and combine it with an arbitrary recovery manager. Okay. So you have to define the constraints. Define the constraints among these components, among the scheduler and the recovery manager, for example. They could do like that, so they could conflict actually. Some scheduling, it appears also, this is also derived from the literature. From the literature, that follows that some concurrent control algor algorithms conflict with recovery algorithms. So we have to specify these as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Typically, it can be done in a formal way. A serial scheduler does not synchronize operations for recovery. You can specify like that. If scheduler synchronization scheme is serial, then recovery manager failure at some synchronizer is nil. So you, so you have to define it in some way. This is just one example. Defining intra component constraints, there could be constraints between different components, but also within the same, uh, uh, relate to the same components. 
because you have a scheduler, so it's a distributed system. Okay. So a scheduler could conflict with a scheduler of another component. This is an example. Conservative two-phase locking schedulers need only either a deadlock detector or an infinite blocking detector. Can do like this, specify like that. Optimistic and timestamp ordering schedulers need only detectors for either an infinite restart or a cyclic restart. A ser serial scanner does not need to de detect failures. So it's some formal way to specify these constraints. We will not elaborate on this further. What is important here is that we, of course, again, the stakeholder uh, requirements are important. There's a huge set of these alternatives. So we have to discuss with the stakeholders which alternatives are important. Okay. The stakeholder can focus on a specific part. Like in the transaction case, so a specific transaction management approach could, could be selected. Out of the 32, some, some subset uh, schedulers and the recovery measure not, all, not the complete 180, but a specific set. So at the architecture level, you decide that. Which means that you don't, don't implement that later on. Uh, that's the uh, alternative space for so far. The transaction theory, we have to define the overall architecture. This domain is stable, this will be stable. We have refined, looked at the specific concepts, we have defined the, cons, uh, the, uh, the substructure, but also look at the alternatives which uh, these concepts represent. The alternatives plus the constraints. That's so far the alternatives in the domain. And we go further with the mapping architecture to design. So we have the conceptual architecture. We have to define a detailed design. That's the point here. So we have software architecture. We have to map to a detailed design. So there's no coding here, but detailed design. How to implement, how to realize the architecture. Various transaction systems must be customized from the given architecture. We have one architecture, we should be able to define multiple systems. Transaction systems must be implemented using the object oriented model. See, there you decide. The architecture itself was, didn't say anything about that. Here we say it, we, we need to de define detailed design using OO techniques. Performance and adaptability are important features. When mapping this, we have to define, take into account that your design is adaptable, that, it per, that it's, it is valid with respect to performance constraints. That brings us to the second source of, of uh, alternatives. The first was in the domain itself. The second is when you map to detailed design, you have also a number of alternatives. Number of alternative uh, implementations, possible realizations of your architecture, the, the detailed design. It's not just one to one. Okay. So here we should check how many alternative implementations and how to select these based on the provided quality criteria. This was our top level architecture, okay, transaction architecture. We say this is stable, it's based on domain, so uh, stable domain. And now we are going to map this to object oriented design. So one way is just one to one. So we map each uh, concept 
in the, in the conceptual structure, in the conceptual architecture to a class. So it's object or design or implementation view or module view. So we'll see. Okay. So we map now from domain to a, a real a module view. It's one-to-one -one mapping. This, this is possible, but you could, this could be also another alternative. This is a part of the architecture. Then here we have decided, so we said we have data manager, which was a, a, a concept. We included a recovery manager scheduler. Scheduler has synchronization strategies, scheme, and performance failure detector. Here we, we, map, we have decided to map this whole structure to one class, and the whole scheduling, the scheduling is provided in the schedule operations. So why would we do this? Typically, let's say this is better for performance. Rather than mapping each concept to a separate class, map to a one class, and all these scheduling issues map to operation so that we have better performance. We could also do like this. This is the data measure, the scheduler. We could map to such a structure. So data manager as operation schedule. A scheduler, you have universal scheduler, which provides an abstract interface. And the specific schedulers are defined as subclasses. Okay. Typically, this could be done because of, of reuse, right? You define here the abstract interface so that all the schedulers can reuse that. Okay. Focus on reuse. Again, a different alternative. So you have you have some conceptual structure, but you have to map to a detailed design. But it appears that uh, different possible solutions are, are, are possible. It's clear. This is again another one. Here we map every concept to a class, and these, cla these concepts become like part of, and this could be for a runtime adaptability. Why is this runtime adaptable? Better. So what's runtime adaptable? Synchronization strategy. Synchronization scheme and performance failure detector. It's part of, right? You can just at runtime, we can just define a new object and define a different uh, strategy scheme or, or performance failure detector. Okay. Well, actually, in the, in the transaction system that we had to design, runtime adaptability was an important issue. So. We are forced somehow to also define this design. Okay. So based on the quality concerns, your design is shaped. So quality shapes or reshapes the architecture. In domain analysis, we define the conceptual structure, the stable structure. But when we map the concept of structure to detailed design, we have to take into account quality concerns. And based on these quality concerns, we have to look at the, the set of alternatives. And we select the most feasible one with respect to the, the quality concerns which matter to us. Okay. Adaptability, reuse, security, performance, whatever should be clear. So quality requirements, quality concerns impose, can impose a different restructuring than the original conceptual structure. But 
of course, every concept is still in your system, whether mapped to a, a component, an attribute, or operation. It is there. So we have to select, this is the conceptual structure, you have to, what are the alternatives? There are really plenty of alternatives. That's the first question. What are the alternatives? And the second question is, of course, what are the, that's the question. An alternative or not, that's the question. How to select design alternatives? That's the second question. You have, you have lots of alternatives. So which one should we choose? And what are the quality factors? In the domain alternatives, we specified this. It was uh, somehow we could define through feature diagrams and, and specify what the alternatives are. And by actually uh, discussing with the stakeholders, we can select the, the required alternatives. When mapping to the design, we have again a number of, of alternatives. And there, the, the quality considerations become important. Which ones should you select based on which quality factor? Okay. Well, let's look at design alternatives for quality. This is the case, transaction management, manager architecture, we have to map to design. What are the quality criteria we have to identify? It's adaptability, reuse time, performance, maintenance, reliability, portability, etc. This is a set, typically defined in ITP standards in software engineering. Uh, all these quality concerns. So in our case, we could say I we would like to have an adaptable design. For some parts of the system, we should consider time performance. We are dealing with various de dealers, so we must also focus on reuse. Okay. So actually, in the architectural requirements analysis, also we can also define these concerns. Our problem and as we also have identified which quality concerns are important. Okay. And these will also shape our design. Uh, if we look at adaptability, some questions need to be uh, uh, considered. What is adaptability? Why do we need to adapt? What to adapt? How to adapt? When to adapt? What are the constraints? What is the cost of adaptability? What are limitations? How to measure adaptability? This comes to our mind if you have to take into account adaptability. Adaptability definition, the ease with which software artifacts can be adapted to the changing requirements. Ease of changeability. Adaptability can be considered as functional transformation. It's like some at, in, in, at time t plus one, the system will be the adapted version of at, at time t. It's, it's very abstract, sense, but the ease of changeability. So let's just consider some examples. So for that, so we are we said so we have transaction system adaptability is important important quality concern. So we need to have define, uh, a good understanding of the quality concern. We have simple adaptability model. For that, we will check what is fixed, what is compile time adaptable, what is runtime adaptable. Based on this model, we will check for each arch architectural concept, identify its adaptability property. Is it fixed? Should it be fixed? Should it be compile time adaptable? Should it be runtime adaptable? Based on that, we will map the architectural concepts to the appropriate object model. This top level architecture. So we take a 
a very simple adaptability model which just states whether it's fixed compile time or runtime adaptable. Imagine we have this. You say atomic object should be fixed. No need to adapt it. Why should you adapt? Transaction application is fixed. This car it, it ch checks whether the car should be reserved or not, and that reserves. Transaction manager, policy manager, data manager should be compiled and adaptable. And we would like to have scheduler and recovery manager runtime adaptable. Okay, there's, it's a design decision now. This is the uh, structure from domain, and then we have to do the detailed design. These three should be compile time adaptable. This is the runtime adaptable, and this can be just fixed. Okay. So what's the impact of this on the architecture, on the detailed design? First, consider the. Uh, so we said this should be runtime adaptable. The adaptability mechanism in obje object model for runtime adaptation is uh, part of. You just make something a part of, of something, of another class, of another object, then it becomes runtime adaptable. Compile time adaptable mechanism is inheritance. And fixed, we use inline code or non editable class. Taken this, actually these are the design decisions. They are actually, we can say, actually each design decisions with respect to uh, adaptability concern. Then this leads to this design. Okay. So where is runtime adaptability? We said these two are runtime adaptable, the properties, right? And the, the, the mechanism for doing that is just taking a part of, right? And the others are compile time adaptable. We can just inherit from that and subclass. See? So design decisions changes uh, the way how you should do detailed design. And this is runtime adaptable. Let us consider another example. This is the transaction manager architecture, where we could say decide, again design decision, this should be fixed, no need to adapt at compile time or runtime. The child management should be compile time adaptable, that is, I should be able just to subclass, compile it, and then generate a new. Uh, child management and child authority and child and the initiation protocol, commit protocol, abort protocol should be runtime adaptable. So can you imagine now the design of this somehow? Transaction manager. This is commit, initiate, abort. We have made this part of. Why? Runtime was important. Here. Yeah. This is this should be runtime. And the only way to do that is actually here in the object model when we use it. We find it as a as a part of. We could also use some patterns, but I just show the, the elementary way. Then the, uh, the child management and parent transaction management should be compiled and adaptable. This is the result of that design decision. And we have property controller here. This is the design decision. So we have to map the architecture to detailed design. For that, we have to take into account quality concerns. We have list these. We said adaptability is important. But uh, to understand adaptability, we, we made a very simple model of it. And then this, this adaptability model will shape your detailed design. Okay. 
So here we can see the direct input, the direct impact of the quality concern. So this is the scheduler architecture. Uh, again, we can say like we can say this is runtime adaptable. All these, we want them all runtime adaptable. What does it mean here? Scheduler. So you should now have grasped the ID. Sorry, they? All determined at runtime. Yeah, but how? So you will have a scheduler class and then this, what happens to this? What will we design? What's the mechanism for runtime eligibility? Part of, right? So then each, each of these should become a class, right? And they become part of schedule. Okay. J just one example how, how quality impacts the, the architecture. This is it. Oh, so we said every, everything should be runtime eligible. So we make everything a class. So we have a decider, accept handler, reject handler, delay handler. Performance manager should also be runtime adaptable. So it's a class, it's part of commit protocol, abort protocol. They are all runtime. Can we have a compile time adaptable class after a runtime adaptable class? Yeah, if you have if you take object model. If it's runtime adaptable, it is also compile time adaptable. No. If we have runtime adaptable class, yes. can we use the compile time adaptable class after that, which uses runtime adaptable class? That if you choose a runtime adaptable class, and after that you want to choose? Compile time adaptable. Can you give an example here? Which? Yes. Is that possible? Yes. Then you don't make it a class, but typically in the object oriented model you could say I make it an operation of here. Then I have to subclass this and I have to redefine. Does it cause a problem because synchronization decision, turn on that, run time, and we want to accept and will be compile time adaptable? Uh, no, then, then this is, ex it's possible, except handler is still then only at compile time possible. You can change the synchronization decision at, at runtime, but only these two per, per, uh, properties will be able to be changed at runtime. But this will be just the, what is in, uh, defined in the operation. Okay, so you get different kind of structure and this is just one example and actually uh, here we don't use any patterns at all also, of course here it makes sense to use some some pattern right uh, we, we used actually here here a pattern this is a composite pattern right transaction manager has parent transaction manager can have transaction manager again okay. The idea here is that, that we see this, yeah. the impact of quality, that's what it, it, uh, the object model defines, so it's actually the target, you have the conception structure, the, the target is object model, there are different alternative mappings possible. Okay. And here we try to control that process by looking at the quality. We don't want just an arbitrary detailed design, but it should be a detailed a des design, a mapping of architecture to a module view, which represents, which meets our quality concerns. Okay, clear?
Let's have a short exercise before we stop. This is the exercise. This should be compile time, compile time. This should be runtime, runtime. So what will be the the design? This you can think of that. So what do we do with this? Yeah, this just class and they will become a, a part of this becomes part of which but this will be compile time so typically this will be an operation could be right operation scheduler we have, don't have that much time so otherwise this is so uh, let me show it. Decide check performance commit abort. See? Decide commit abort. I was check performance. This should be there. Accept handler, reject handler, delay handler. It's runtime. Right? Performance manager is also runtime. Like here. And we have some compile time and ability of the scheduling decision. That's the result here. This should be compile time adaptable. So it's implicit reasoning. So, so uh, to have something runtime adaptable in object orientation, the mechanisms for that are fixed. To have something compile time adaptable mechanism is, is fixed. So it defines, so what does the, the, the source, the target, plus the quality defines actually your design, design alternative. Eva, uh, almost done. <laughs> I, wa I was almost done. Uh, this is scheduler 2. Again, another example. Log management restarting. So this is for recovery manager. If we select this, this should be compiled, uh, runtime adaptable. We don't care about the others. Then this is the result. Okay. So the re realization, there's no coding here. Just realization. Well, more things. Uh, can you provide two other quality concerns that impact your design? Do these conflict with adaptability concern? How would you optimize? Two other quality concerns, which we have seen actually. So usually, if you design, it's not you don't just optimize for one quality. There are multiple quality concerns. So can you imagine two, two more quality concerns, which could be important here? Cost and performance. Cost and performance, good one. Time performance. So does time performance conflict with adaptability? You say yes. Why? If you make adaptable, then we do like this, right? Yeah. Is this good or bad for performance? If you want time performance, you should merge to plus and right. one single. If you put, would map this just to operation, it's better for time performance. So actually, in general, it appears that adaptability and time performance conflict. So what would you do to, to resolve this conflict? It's an inherent conflict. 
It's not artificial. If something needs to be adaptable, usually there's some intermediate layer, but that is bad for time performance. It's a general pattern action. So how, how would you solve this? How would you optimize? We can find the middle way uh, for them, mm -hmm. or we can choose the higher priority one. Good. Good. So you can try to find the something which is feasible to both quality concerns, so kind of metric space where the distance should be uh, close to each, or you can check which is more important, adaptability or time performance. Okay. So that's the, you have to uh, explicitly uh, discuss and model this. Quality factors might conflict, adaptability, time performance, you gave it. Well, also availability, safety, security, performance, reuse, cost. Cost actually conflicts with all the quality concerns. <laughs> yeah, the, the more equality you put, the more it costs. So you have to optimize always for, for quality. Okay, that was it uh, for today. Any questions about this? Good. And we continue next Wednesday. Thank you.